And I'd like to welcome everyone this evening to our program with the Harrison Public Library and authors Robert Schuster and Annette Binder. And I'd like to introduce them to you. Robert Schuster's novel, Tzenzi, was the winner of the 2019 AWP Prize for the novel and a recipient of a James Jones First Novel Fellowship. His short fiction has appeared in North American Review, Witness, Mississippi Review, Stone Canoe, The Winter Anthology, War, Literature and the Arts, and Alaska Quarterly Review, and in the anthologies Microfiction and Yellow Silk too. A former art critic for The Village Voice and Seattle Weekly, he lives in Westchester County, New York. L. Annette Binder was born in Germany and immigrated to the US as a small child. She holds degrees in classics and law from Harvard, an MA in comparative literature from the University of California at Berkeley, and an MFA from the program in writing at the University of California, Irvine. Her short fiction collection, Rise, received the Mary McCarthy Prize in short fiction. Her short stories have appeared in the Pushcart Prize Anthology, the Penn O'Henry Prize Stories, One Story, The Southern Review, and others. The Washington Sky is her first novel, and Annette lives in New Hampshire. So I think we will be starting with Robert. Yes, hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to first thank uh, the Harrison um, Library and um, also the bookstore, the Village Bookstore in Pleasantville, New York for um, both you know, hosting and sponsoring the event, which is, which is terrific. So um, before I read a couple of pages from um, the first chapter of my novel, uh, let me just give a little bit of a description of, of where the passage begins. Um, the novel To Zenzi is about a German boy, 13-year-old Tobias Kurtig, who navigates his way through the ruins of Berlin in the spring of 1945 at the end of the war, where he encounters tragedy, treachery, absurdity, and love. The novel opens in a bomb shelter where Tobias is the assistant to the air raid warden. It's a March night of very heavy bombardment, which has brought lots of fire and destruction to the city. When the all clear siren sounds, Tobias's mother begs the boy to remain in the shelter until she returns with his father because the streets she feels are too dangerous. His father has, been, has not been staying in the bomb shelter during the air raids, but in their villa's basement because he's worried about looters stealing his high-priced art collection. But after performing his cleanup duties, Tobias doesn't obey his mother, like all 13-year-olds, and ventures out to find his parents on his own. The novel is narrated by Tobias himself as an 84-year-old man looking back on his life in the war. Do you hear the dog barking, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'll begin a little bit into the first chapter. I did not, of course, wait for my mother and father to return. I rushed out the door into the cauldron. The air clutched at me, stung me, foul, bitter. Flames curled everywhere. A fog of white ash went into my mouth and nostrils. Yes. Everyone had been right. The bombing had been worse than ever. It was 4 a.m., but the light shined like noon. The fires and smoke confused my knowledge of the city. Squinting, I could not see very well. More walls had come down, cascades of stone. At first, I didn't know which way to go. Others were scurrying around in confusion, too. I darted past youth army boys acting as firemen and aiming hoses that seemed to hold no water. A uniformed man shouted into a megaphone, assemble here for fire duty, assemble down the block for recovery duty, assemble there for damage clearance. I scrambled over bricks and the curlicue tops of fallen lampposts 
and past a blackened trolley turned sideways like a roasted pig and found the Lanver Canal. We lived close to it. We used to stroll along its banks. So I jogged down one side, following the path of the water shimmering orange. Our street ran parallel more or less to the canal and cutting over, I saw the solid sign still standing with the heavy script and the little profile of a bear on top. And I nearly cried. It was not far now to our villa. But the buildings had come down here too. And the further I went, the less I recognized. At one point I doubled back, sure I had made a mistake. No, the sign said it was our street. Bricks everywhere, a big iron oven had tumbled down from a kitchen and half a bed and a pile of underwear, plus a body face down on the rubble. By the way, do you hear the dog? Is, is, the, dog, is the dog audible? Okay, okay, fine. I pushed through a small crowd that had gathered, including the city police, and I bolted for our building. I jammed in the key. It would not turn. I tried it a dozen times, in and out, back and forth, knowing something was wrong. I ran back into the street to question the crowd, and I could see that many were giving me strange expressions, open mouth. Then I looked more closely at the body on the pile of bricks a woman whose dress was rumpled up so that you could see her underclothes in the leaping fire shadows and also on her feet, a pair of clunky men's shoes. It took me a while to absorb the explanations from the nervous crowd to understand what had happened. A bomb had hit our apartment building right on top. The key would not work because I was trying a door across the street. I had become so confused. It was our oven in the street, our bed. Of course, I had not recognized that either. My father was underneath all those bricks, flattened, not alive. Even so, my mother had rushed up to find him, using those big shoes to climb over bricks. Close by, an old man, a member of the auxiliary police on guard duty, he had only just learned how to fire a rifle. Well, he mistook my mother for a looter and killed her with a single bullet to the neck, a dumb luck shot. Not so surprising, I went into a little craziness. From that pile of underwear in the street, I scooped up a scorched pair, maybe my father's, and started waving it around my head, shouting obscenities, demanding to see the man who had killed my mother. He had in fact scurried off, ashamed of his act, and I would never learn his name. But what did it matter? I never knew the crew who had dropped the bomb either. When several people tried to calm me down, I became louder, whipping the underwear around in a frenzy and telling the crowd they were trespassing. They did not belong here. I climbed atop the bricks near my mother's body and picked up a handful of shards and hurled it in their direction and that sent them running. A few frail members of the auxiliary police still insisted on removal of the bodies but I threatened them with a plank of floorboard. And because more ghastly trouble elsewhere required their attention, they left me alone. For the next few hours in the cold, I shivered on the rubble, though not freezing because the smoldering fires deeper down sent up warmth. I apologized to my mother over and over for my rudeness, holding her bluing fingers and peered into the orange embers below for any glimpse of Vati. Once I thought I heard his music playing, and then I worried that if anyone discovered it was French, they would not allow a proper burial. I imagined that the souls of my parents had risen into heaven, but wondered if the next batch of planes, the Americans who bombed during the day, would bother them up there. My brain was flipping over and over. The sun rose, scavengers emerged from basements. Sleep grabbed me. In a dream, I smelled sweetish smoke. It reminded me of calmer days in the cafes with Vati. And then in chilly sunlight, I looked up to see Herr Fuchs balancing himself on the bricks, the pipe stuck in his mouth, this time lighted. We heard about what happened, he said, and we are all deeply sorry. Why don't you come with me? Someone will take care of your parents. 
the American planes will be on top of us soon and it won't be safe outside. And so I followed the pipe smoking man across the rubble to another life. And that is the end of the first chapter. And I'm going to um, show a few slides now. So this is um, a scene of Berlin taken at the end of the war. And you can see it's just absolutely devastated. The buildings are just shells. It looks like a, um, a sand castle that's been swept over by a wave. There's really nothing left. Berlin was bombed continuously for five years as were other German cities. And it's estimated that about 600,000 civilians uh, died in Germany as a result of the air raids, which is a pretty big number. But the accounts of life during that time are actually few in number. Uh, W.G. Sebald, author of the celebrated novel, The Rings of Saturn, wondered why this was so and mentions it briefly in that novel. And in his last published book, a book of essays, he wrote a long piece on the subject and suggested that the massive bombing of Germany doesn't occupy uh, much space in the German cultural memory because both outsiders and the citizens themselves felt to some extent that they deserved it. The number of 600,000, of course, is a, a, a large number, but it's, it's dwarfed by the massacre of uh, you know, 6 million Jews and millions in other groups. Um, the bombing of civilian targets was intended to break morale, but it never really did. And the Nazi the bigwigs were relatively safe in the Führer's bunker and well supplied, uh, continuing the defense of Berlin until only boys and old men were left fighting. Uh, for a city of Berlin's population, the casualty rate was not as high as elsewhere. Around 50,000 died in Berlin itself from air raids over the five years. But compare that to the loss of 30,000 to 40,000 people in a single night in each of the fire bombings of Hamburg and Dresden. Uh, Berlin was less prone to firestorms because many of the buildings were stone and the streets were fairly wide. Here's another uh, scene of, of Berlin after the war. It took, of course, many, many years to rebuild the city um, with help from the Marshall Plan, which was, it came into effect around 1948. Uh, here are refugees fleeing the street in Berlin. And if this were 1945, um, they would ha likely have very little chance of getting out because the Russians by mid-April of 45 had surrounded the city. This is a little smaller, maybe a little harder to see, but this is one of the hippos in the Berlin Zoo. If you look closely, you can see rubble in the background. And this was taken during the war. The zoo was a pretty sad place during the war. Lots of animals were killed by the bombs or simply starved to death. There were stories of tigers and lions having uh, escaped and roaming the streets, but these are largely apocryphal, I think. The novel has two scenes at the zoo, both involving uh, a gorilla, a real gorilla called Pongo. And at the end of the war, Pongo was found dead in his cage next to a dead SS officer, which I um, found a little, a little strange. Um, so I, and there was no explanation for it, but I, as a fiction writer, I invented a reason for it, which is one of the stranger scenes in the book. Here is, um, on, on April 20th, 1945, uh, Hitler turned 56. And as he had done before, he personally decorated boys with iron crosses for acts of heroism. Uh, outside the bunker, surrounded by ruins, 19 boys received medals that day. But I thought the number was a little strange. Why 19 and not 20, which would match his birthday? Well, I decided to make my protagonist, Tobias, the 20th boy, 
lost to the historical record, who was there by accident, having been mistaken for a hero in battle when he was actually in hiding. And it's a pivotal scene in the book because it brings Tobias back to Berlin and into the bunker itself, HQ bunker, where he's given a rather unusual assignment. This is an English translation of a page <clears throat> from the Verba Wetzler report, although sometimes known as the Auschwitz Protocols. Rudolf Verba and Alfred Wetzler were Slovakian Jews who managed to escape the Auschwitz death camp in April of 1944. And their uh, horrific descriptions of the camp were soon collected into a 33 page report along with sketches they had made and printed by at least a couple of Swiss newspapers. Now in the novel, Tobias's girlfriend, Zenzi, who is a so-called Mischling, that's the Nazi, Nazi designation, Mischling of a second degree, meaning she is not Jewish herself, but had a Jewish grandparent. Anyway, she gets her hands on a smuggled copy of one of these Swiss newspapers and shows Tobias the report. It's another pivotal scene in the book as Tobias, who'd been skeptical of the existence of these death camps as other Germans were, is horrified, horrified in particular by the, the description of bodies being turned into fertilizer. And finally here is a picture of refugees crossing the Elbe River. Um, on the other side, the, the western side of the Elbe River were the Americans. They had been told to stop at the Elbe by Eisenhower. He didn't want them to be involved in the battle for, for Berlin. So the Americans were, were there on the other side and the refugees were trying to get to them. If you got to them, you were safe. Um, on the eastern side of the bridge, the Russians were still lobbing shells onto the remnants of the German army. So. It was uh, fraught with peril right up until the last minute trying to get out of Berlin. And once you did get to the other side, to the Americans, um, things didn't improve too much because you were put into uh, the so-called DP camps, the displaced, displaced person camps, which in some cases were not much better than the actual concentration camps. So. That's it for my slides, and I think I will now turn things over to Annette. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening. I am a huge admirer of your novel and feel very lucky that I got the chance to read an early copy of it. Um, I think your prose is, is just exquisite and what you're able to do is capture the strangeness and the horror but also the moments of grace and of, of love that happened during during the war. And you do that so beautifully. Oh, thank you. So um, my novel, like yours, is set in World War II Germany during the last six months of the war. It's also from the German perspective. And it is really the story of a mother trying to hold her family together during those last six months um, in a small town in southern Germany. Uh, the mother, Edda Huba, has two boys. Her older son, Max, has come home from the Eastern Front suffering from a mental breakdown. And Edda knows that she's going to have to conceal his condition from the authorities because otherwise they'll take him from her and she knows she won't get him back. Uh, at the same time, her younger son, Georg, like Tobias, uh, is in the Hitler Youth and he's only 15. And when he sees his chance, he runs away from his post and tries to make his way back home uh, to his mother. And so what I thought I'd do as well is uh, share a couple of slides about the inspiration for the book. And I'll start at the beginning here. Hopefully I can get it to play. Um, so the book is set in the town of Magdeidenfeld am Main, which is in Unterfranken, Lower Franconia, uh, where both of my parents were from. And so much of the book was really inspired by my father's story, a story that I didn't know uh, while 
16 without ever having shared anything about his childhood with me. Uh, but when I was years later, when I was first starting to write fiction, I came across a photo album that showed my father as a young boy. This would have been in 1937. He was born in 1930. And then the last photograph in the album was taken in 1944 in his Hitler Youth uniform. And I had not known he'd been in the Hitler Youth. And while it shouldn't have been a surprise to me, given his age and that it was compulsory for most boys at that point, it was still stunning for me to see him in the uniform and to see the difference in the expression on his face as a young mischievous boy of seven and as um, a boy of 14 who had real sadness in his eyes. And it was a sadness that I knew even as an adult because it was something that he carried with him. I came across a couple of other things as well. Um, Germans had to fill out uh, racial purity notebooks. And I came across my father's book, uh, which traced his ancestry all the way back to 1819. And what you had to do, it had tabs for your parents, your grandparents, great grandparents, you know, just going farther and farther back. And you had to have um, documentation either from a town official or from a church showing uh, that you had no Jewish background. And so I came across this and it was absolutely chilling to me. Uh, and it really started me thinking about what it would have been like to have lived under a regime that required this of its people. And if you failed to do it, or if you did it and it revealed something about your, about your ancestry uh, that was unacceptable, it would lead almost certainly to you know, catastrophe for you and, and for your family. And so this, this weighed on me, thinking of the horror of living under a regime like this. And I also found, strangely, his cursive notebook from when he would have been nine, going on 10, uh, learning this sort of elaborate uh, German cursive. And to learn the letter G, they had to write Goebbels, 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 Göring, Göring, Göring. And just the, the insanity of this regime and how it absolutely percolated through every aspect of life. Uh, these were things that really influenced me as I wrote and sort of tried to imagine what it would have been like being a family that wasn't actively part of the party, but at the same time wasn't actively heroically resisting. Uh, you know, what was it like to live under, under this sort of a regime? Um, the town where much of the action is set is very close to the city of Würzburg, uh, which is a beautiful old university town in under Franconia, also on the Main River, uh, known for its half-timbered architecture and for its um, university. And it too was bombed by the British mostly, although also by the Americans. And the British um, bombed it massively in mid-March 1945, right around the same time that your book starts, uh, Robert. Uh, and about four, between four and 5,000 civilians were killed. The inner city was absolutely destroyed. Many more thousands were left homeless. And one of my mother's earliest memories um, was actually of her father being caught in an earlier bombing of the train station uh, in February. Uh, she would have only been five at the time, but she remembers him coming back home to their town with his winter coat torn and bloodied. You know, and so I knew that the bombing of Wurzburg was going to play a, a sort of major role in the story. And, and sort of as I wrote it, as I wrote the book, I figured out exactly how. Um, strangely, the, the bombing and the destruction that it wrought did not break the German will. And the Germans decided to fight for the rubble in Würzburg. They fought harder than, you know, than they would have, I think, if the city had not been destroyed. And so you had the Americans coming through right around Easter 1945, and you had German boys, the Hitler Youth boys, you had the old men fighting for every overturned stone. And, and much of the fighting sort of happened as people were tunneling through the destroyed buildings, like in the cellars underneath. Uh, the city uh, was cleaned up and it started to be re uh, rebuilt relatively quickly by the rubble women, so-called. So 
Uh, and because the bodies were very hard to find in the rubble, people were leaving messages. So here someone is letting a woman know that her parents are alive and can be found at a certain address in the rubble. Uh, so I thought I would also share uh, a scene. I'm having trouble unsharing my screen for some reason. Let's see. There we go. I thought I would also read just a very short section that happens relatively late in the novel um, with the bombing of the city of Wurzburg. And what's happened here is that Max, uh, his breakdown has been discovered and he's been taken away to the psychiatric clinic in Wurzburg. And what that psychiatric clinic was actually doing was systematically murdering Germans uh, with mental illness and other neurological conditions. And this is something that only came to light relatively recently. I think the scale of what was happening at this clinic uh, has really been openly discussed within the last couple of decades. And so Etta has come to Max at the clinic and has been trying to get him out without any luck. And now the bombs have started to fall and she's in the city and she realizes that this is, might be her chance to get him out safely that in some ways the the bombing might be her opening to get him out and have the papers that are keeping him there be destroyed so she's she's found him and they're leaving now together they went together through the doors and no one stopped them or asked for papers they reached bahnhofstrasse and everywhere people were coming out from the shelters and their basements pressing close together and pointing to the sky. They stood on the curb and turned round in circles to see what the planes had done. Fires burned by the dozens along the streets of the old town and up into the wine hills. The city was bright with them. They burned around the Marienkapelle and the Dome St. Kilian and all along Theresienstrasse and on the rooftops down by the river. Copper melted from the spires and dripped to the streets below and people didn't run yet, and they didn't shout. They felt the pull of what was coming. They stood on their tiptoes to see. Etta raised her hand to her forehead and shielded her eyes, but it did no good. The light found its way in. A walnut tree was burning in the courtyard. It shed flames from its trunk. It stood real as a person, that tree, real as a man with arms stretched wide, and still it turned to powder. The flames quivered for a moment and then leapt across to some juniper bushes and to another tree and rose again. They twisted and dripped and fed themselves and the smoke wound ribbons in the air. We can't stay here, Etta said. She reached for Max's wrist. We need to go down by the water. They'd follow the bank, follow it all the way home, and then they'd pack him for the hills. Trains were running just outside the city. Things were fine in Ochsenfurt and Klingenberg and farther out by Heidenfeld. Things were just as they'd always been. The sky was dark there and the stars shone and people were sleeping in their beds. She pulled again on Max's wrist and when he didn't move, she set her hands against his cheeks and turned his face toward hers. We're going home, she told him. Something quivered in the air just then. It was real as the beat of wings. The air turned, and from one moment to the next, those many points of light found each other. The flames ran together like water and gained a terrible power, and the towers began to burn, all of the towers in the city. They shot flames into the sky, and only the golden Madonna atop the Maria steeple tower was untouched. She held out her hands and watched from above as people ran and shouted and fell on the streets. They beat against their chests and gasped. They crouched low against the cobblestones and scratched like cats. The air rose all at once. It bucked up and rose to meet the flames and it bore people upward as if making an offering. Metal burned easily as wood in the heat. Things turned to powder and drifted back down. People lay outside the buildings and on the riverbank and in the squares of Old Town. They lay on their backs and on their sides, and some of them looked up toward the sky with eyes wide open, and the ash fell over them all. <laughs>
and covered them. Uh, so, you know, I knew the bombing would play a, a major role uh, in the book, but I didn't know how. And I think that's one of the sort of wonderful and strange things about writing fiction is that you're constantly surprised. Uh, you might have an idea of where things are going, but on a day on a daily basis, your characters shake their heads and say no and lead you in a totally different direction. And all you can really do, at least for me, is follow them and see where they'll where they'll take me. Uh, the surprises that that I sort of had day by day were one of the great pleasures of writing the book. Yeah, I had the same sort of uh, feeling, you know, and I would I would find my characters wanting to do something. And then I thought, well, I don't really know as much as I should about that certain thing. So then I went off and started doing more research in a certain area. And then you find little tidbits in another book and you think, oh, I've got to include that. And, uh, and, it, and so it goes, you know? <laughs> exactly. I would, you know, I would find actual objects. My, I was with my husband, he, he makes knives as a hobby. <laughs> and so he was at a uh, at a show where you can buy materials like for handles and things. And there was someone there who had old books in German. <laughs> and so I found this amazing old book that someone had painstakingly, it was from the Abdullah Cigarette Company. And they had painstakingly um, taken all the little geographic like stickers that came, not really stickers, but you know, pictures, little postcards, and they'd filled in the whole book. They must have smoked a lot of cigarettes to get all the pictures for this book. And I was just captivated by this book. And I had no idea what role it was going to play, but I knew it was important. And so I spent $40, which seemed crazy at the time to buy this book, but now I'm so glad it, it found its way in. Uh, you know, one of the women that Georg, who's run away from his post, meets along the way. Her husband had filled in all of those, all of those little cards. And Georg, who dreams only of being someplace else, he's a magician and he does sleight of hand and he's, He's so, sort of a soft, dreamy boy, and he looks at these pictures from faraway places, and it just fuels his his desire to disappear, you know, to, to be palmed away himself. And so that's right. There's lots of objects. I think writers are sort of magpie-like in terms of the things that they collect. Uh, what were some of yours, Robert, like some of the things that you found that you knew well, were going to play a role? There was, um, like, th those, those pictures reminded me of, there's a scene in the book, um, the scene of battle when the Russians have a plane flying overhead that is not shooting at them, it's dropping leaflets. But the leaflets are uh, pages from a magazine, specifically uh, advertisements for Nivea cream, which is a big German company mm -hmm. um, that made these, you know, it still does, makes the creams and showing pictures of babies and uh, young women, you know, saying how much these creams freshen your face and so forth. And so they're, you know, it's a strange scene. It's they're being dropped on, on the battlefield. And that was, I, I don't remember exactly where I discovered that, found that I may have, you know, it's like half imagination and half fact, but um, that was one example of, of some little tidbit that I took and, and turned into a scene. Another was um, the Russians used camels uh, as part of their transportation, uh, which is somewhat unusual. Uh, <laughs> and so I had a scene with a camel in there also on the battlefield. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think your book so, so beautifully captures the surreal moments you know the horse i mean where was the inspiration for the horse that makes that very stunning cover uh well the horse the cover of the, uh, the, the horse on the cover uh kind of refers to a couple of different things um it's a sculpted horse uh upside down so it sort of plays with the idea that, of the um the icon the statue of the horse representing military might um, but in this case, upside down, which is a, sort of appropriate for the sorts of things that happen in the book, the absurd scenarios that happen in the book, and the fact that the German army is uh, just being completely run over and, and defeated. Um, 
But there's also a scene in the book with a, with a real horse. Um, I won't spoil it, but um, it's, it's, it represents, the upside down horse represents that scene. Mm -hmm. And of course, horses uh, at that time in Berlin and probably most German cities were the only form of meat that you could find. <laughs> Uh, the horses died and the people would come out with their knives and uh, carve off the, the flesh. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I mean, I learned a lot about the sort of deprivation uh, for people who weren't farmers. You know, my mom would always say the farmers and the priests were the ones who ate well and the ordinary people who didn't have a farming family or relatives in the hills who had lots of crops uh, were really were really struggling, especially by the end of the war. Yeah, yeah. and and there's um, a scene in my book too with uh, a farmer who hands the boys are waiting in the station to go to the Eastern Front. They're very they're starving. They're all very hungry, and the farmer comes around with a crop of a, a spargel. Right? Is that how you say it? Uh, yeah. which is white, white asparagus mm -hmm. uh, and gives them each an asparagus stalk to chew on. Yeah, you know, my mom uh, told me that when she, you know, she was about four or five, she was getting so hungry at that point that a little bit of yeast and it would sort of bloat your belly and take away, mm. you know, take away the pangs. And that found its way in the book. Uh, so much of what my mom was able to tell me, even though my father hadn't really told me anything, once I found these photographs of him, I went to her and she was able to fill me in. And, and so many of those details do find their way uh, in. It's, it's really, mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. You know, and at the same time, I think research can really be almost, uh, intoxicating and you want to keep researching keep researching and there were times i just had to put all that away and just start to start you know going back to the characters yes i you know had finished my first draft and you know still had several books on the fall of berlin that i hadn't read yet and i would start reading them and i would find more little things that i thought oh gosh i really would like to get that into the book and then at some point you just have to say enough is enough. <laughs> exactly. You can't, you can't get everything in and you don't want to make that uh, mistake of writing a historical novel where you're sort of showing off all the things you learned. Um, I guess my rule was sort of no 10 times more than you're actually going to put in the book. Exactly. <laughs> that, that way you sort of have the confidence uh, to, to, you know, that much, you sort of have the confidence to um, make it sound real. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. And I think only your characters can do that for you anyway. You know what I mean? That the research can't help that much with the characters. The characters have their own sort of lives. And so, you know, the research is, is necessary, but it's, it's, it's far from sufficient. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, the research sort of provides sort of a foundation for, for scenes, but you really have to invent the rest of it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? There aren't any questions at the moment in the chat box. So if anyone would like to ask a question, you can type it in, or if you feel comfortable unmuting yourself and asking the question, that's fine as well. You know, one question that I've been asked is, did I travel to Germany to, to research uh, the book? And I strangely really didn't want to. I, I really was trying to keep myself in a, in a bubble in sort of 1944, 1945. And the idea of seeing people on smartphones and skinny jeans just uh, didn't. Sort of. going there um but you know you saw all saw the first picture that i the first slide that i showed of berlin it was just nothing was left it was a pile of rubble and ash and i really didn't want 
my view of modern day rebuilt Berlin to color um, my narrative or my description. So I decided I would just rely on pictures and um, some footage of uh, the, the area you can find on YouTube. And there were films made shortly after the war that also show the, um, the, the destruction and the rubble of the city. There's Robert Rossellini's um, film, Germany Year Zero, which um, is certainly one of the bleakest films you'll ever, ever see. Uh, if you do see it, make sure you watch the German version. There's an Italian dubbed version, which is pretty bad. Um, but uh, that that was filmed in the rubble. And there was a, another film called The Search, which is lesser known by, as featured Montgomery Clift as an American soldier helping a German boy find his mother. Um, but these films, you know, had had pictures of the rubble at, at, the, at, at the time. So those are the things I sort of relied on rather than actually going there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also a lot of books. I mean, I had um, the Wurzburg would have this yearly chronicle, you know, an annual sort of book that summarized everything that had happened in the city. And so I, I managed to get a copy of the one that was came out in 1946 that sort of summarized everything that had happened in 1945. In, I mean, it's remarkable to me that they were able to put this book out, you know, but there it was perfectly organized, sort of summarizing sort of how they dealt with the bodies and uh, just very helpful in terms mm -hmm. of giving me a sense of what it was like on the ground there. And one challenge I had was that uh, several of my characters in the novel are real historical figures. Um, Martin Borman, Arthur Axman, um, Hitler himself, uh, all, all appear in the book with speaking parts. <laughs> and so, you know, you have to make sure, I wanted to make sure that they sounded like the actual characters. And so, you know, I delved into um, the collection called uh, Hitler's Table Talk, which is this compendium of things that he supposedly said around a table after hours. Um, it was supposedly transcribed by Martin Borman. I'm sure some of it's, you know, perhaps embellished from what he actually said, but still it was useful in giving uh, Hitler a mouthpiece uh, in his last days when he was absolutely insane, uh, more insane than he started out as. Uh, because he was just filled with drugs from his personal doctor and uh, delusional and, um, and possibly had Parkinson's and who knows what else. And uh, Borman, um, he had, uh, there, there was a, his letters were published. I found a, an out of print book of his letters and those were helpful in sort of giving him um, dialogue in, in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, a quick question for you, Annette. Did, did you discover, did you have I, I, you see any letters from your, that your father wrote uh, and, and, or any like a diary entry or anything like that? The actual words that? Nothing from my dad, you know? Yeah. Uh, he and my mom spoke German together. With me, he only spoke in English. My mom was the one who spoke to me in German and insisted, and she would get very upset when I answered in English, which I like to do. <laughs> um, so my father was just completely silent about his childhood and about his life. And other than those things, the, the photographs and um, those notebooks that I found, I really had no written documentation um, about my father's childhood. and. You know, there's no one around at this point who was old enough at that point to really be cognizant of what was happening. His sister was only three at the end of the war, uh, much younger than him. So really, my mom was the source because my father had talked to her over the years of their marriage and sort of told her about his attempt to run away from his post in the Hitler Youth. Um, the father in the Huba family is the head school teacher of this small town and very sort of strict 
person, very rigid. And that was the way my father also, his father's, uh, my father's father, Yosef, was also that way. And he was the head school teacher. So some of the characters were loosely uh, based on my own family history, but really there was nothing, there was nothing there uh, other than just very general ideas of what they were like. And so the Huba family is very different from what I'm sure the Binder family was like. So now I remember in, in your, um, I think you had published a bibliography somewhere where you read um, an account, the Hitler Youth account. I, I, was it uh, Alf, Alf, what's his Alf name? Alphonse Heck, yes. Heck, yes, yes. I, I think I, I read the same account as well as others, but. They yes, are. I thought his account was a very brave account of what it was like to have been completely indoctrinated as a young man. He was a little bit older than my father. You know, I, I'm guessing he was probably four years older than my father, uh, five years older. But um, to be so completely indoctrinated, to believe it so passionately, because that's what the regime did so well, I think, is they tapped into these young boys and girls desires to be heroic and to do good in the world, you know, to fight the good fight. And, and they twisted that in the most horrible way. And then these boys and, and girls were left with the realization that everything that they'd been raised on, everything they'd been taught to believe and fight for was this horrible lie. And they were left with a country in ruins and this realization that they'd been duped. And for some, I think it took years and years to, to reconcile themselves with that. And I think Alphonse Heck in his, in his book, A Child of Hitler, uh, does, you know, does that so beautifully. Uh, just in very plain terms, he describes what he felt and how strongly he felt and how, how it felt years later to, to come to the realization of you know, the horror of it. There yeah. is a, a comment and two questions in the chat. Okay. So I wanted to read Akiko's comment first. She writes, your presentation was absolutely enlightening and thought provoking. I am Japanese. Our city was also devastated by mm -hmm. the atomic bomb. I am able to understand Germany's feelings. I think we should learn the history many times. And then Brenda has a question for both of you. What was the most difficult part of writing the book or your book? I'll let you go first, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, probably the scope of the of the time is so vast. There's so much information out there. There was so much going on. Uh, you have really have to figure out what part of the, the story you want to concentrate on and um, sort of keep it, keep it narrow. I, I mean, I had a number of scenes that I would ha you know, cut later um, that were just extraneous or possibly repetitive or just going off in a direction that I really didn't end up wanting to go. And so I think that for me was one of the most difficult things was just deciding how much, how much to use from the real um, historical record, because my book is a confession. It's an 84 year old man confessing to his life in the war for, for various reasons. Um, and I wanted everything in the book to be plausible. However outlandish it was, I wanted it to be plausible. And so um, that was another difficulty. I, I would sometimes um, study sort of hour by hour timelines of say what happened in the bunker uh, right before Hitler's death to make sure that I was getting things right because I have a slightly alternate version of what happens in there. And so, yeah, you know, so, so gathering all this information was, was quite challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, it's always the first draft, you know, the sort of the terror of the empty page <laughs> and the cursor sort of mocking me, you know, as I as I need to fill that empty page, I could edit 
for hours and hours and hours a day. And I find that very gratifying once I have something to edit, but actually filling that empty page, it can be exhilarating, but it can also be very frustrating. And so I think that's uh, generally what was what was hardest. And it, at certain moments, it's extremely difficult. At other moments, it, it flows much more, you know, but just sort of keeping at it and, and realizing that there will be uh, there will be a story there because uh, I don't work with an outline. You know, I only outline it once I have a first draft and then I sort of look at it for pacing and, and all of that timing. And uh, but uh, that first that first draft can be brutal, <laughs> so, especially on some days. Another um, comment. Oh, sorry. I was just, just going to go back to the, the comment about uh, Japan. Um, you know, the same thing, the same strategy was used there as it was on Germany was that you know a massive air bombing uh, was supposedly going to break um, civilian morale and you know the techniques are questionable there was a fire bombing of course of Tokyo it was similar to the fire bombing of Hamburg and Dresden which you know just killed thousands and the atomic bombs um, you know, the argument goes that those were dropped to save American lives, to prevent an invasion, necessary invasion, but, you know, there's arguments on both sides, but um, the air, air wars never seem to break morale. Uh, you know, it's, you can sort of see that in Vietnam and, and uh, even Iraq, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had another comment or question? A comment from Barbara and a question from Barbara. She writes, I visited Berlin many years ago and certain buildings were purposely left as ruins to remember the war. The contrast between those ruins and the rebuilt modern buildings was dramatic. Not sure if this is still true today though. And then the question for Annette, did your mother shed any light on your father's decision to reveal nothing to you about his youth? Not really. Um, I think my father was a very quiet, person anyway so it's not that you know he was revealing other stuff to me <laughs> you know he really kept his his stories to himself unfortunately and because i was 16 when he got sick and he only had four months from diagnosis to his passing i just didn't have the if i'd asked him he might have told me something but i just didn't have the the foresight or the you know just the knowledge yet at 16 to even think of asking him you know about his life and what what I could learn from it. Uh, so no, my mom, you know, no, but she did share so much with me about, you know, his childhood, what she knew of his childhood and what life was like in Germany, you know, the recipes and those little details of how, you know, how people cross the river and the ferry, the ferrymen who would row people across if they didn't want to take the bridge and just these these little details that I don't think I would have been able to get from anyone else. So in so many ways, this is really um, my mom's book. Yeah, and getting back to the comment about the Berlin ruins, I think there are still sections that are left. Um, uh, and the, the, the actual bunker area where the Fuhrer bunker, that is a, I believe a small park, uh, but with, with informational plaques around it. So you sort of describing what went on underneath underneath the ground there. Um, interestingly, ironically, um, Hitler's architect Albert Speer. You know, there's, there's sort of this megalomaniac um, ideas of turning Berlin into this huge monumental city with giant buildings. That was their plan to rebuild Berlin like that. And one of the crazy ideas that Speer had come up with was that these buildings, when they decayed in a thousand years or so, they should look as pretty as the Roman and Greek ruins when they decay. And of course, the irony is that um, they were ruins uh, from the war from the Russians and the, and the bombing from the British and the Americans. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just, you, you just find, you know, the more you look at the, the, the time there, you just find all these 
absolutely crazy, absurd um, notions, delusional notions that mm -hmm. uh, really color the whole whole time there. Yeah. So another comment also from Barbara for Robert that opening your book with the letter from Tobias was brilliant. Totally grabbed me right oh, away. Thank you. You wanted to know what happened, right? It pulled you in. And Wendy Katz has a question for Annette. Annette, it seems clear that the discovery of your father's past is a very natural point of departure for this particular, oh, actually it's a question for Robert, for this particular kind of book. Robert, do you have a similar point of personal reference? Um, not a direct personal reference, but um, I've always been uh, both fascinated and horrified by war. As a kid, I grew up with Vietnam on the television all the time. And uh, World War II movies in the 1970s were in the theaters all the time. They were on television all the time, you know, Saturday afternoon matinees on television. So in some sense, I was immersed in war as a kid. Uh, I, with my friends, we would go out in the backyard and, and, and you know, perform these battles with either each other or models, toy soldiers and so forth. And as I got older, um, I would read uh, books about the war um, and, uh, you know, like remarks or, you know, the All Quiet on the Western Front was a, uh, a significant point, I think, in my interest in war. It's, you know, definitely an anti-war novel. And um, it was uh, definitely influential on, the, on my novel, To Zenzi. And then when there was Norman Mailer's uh, The Naked and the Dead that I read as a teenager as well. And that was um, also influential, uh, just sort of the brutal descriptions of, of the Japanese fighting. So not a personal connection, but uh, sort of an immersive kind of war interest. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? I would say that if um, if anyone is uh, still thinking about purchasing either of the books, uh, I would encourage you to do so through uh, the Village Bookstore in uh, Pleasantville. They have been very kind to sponsor the event, so. Yes, Jennifer Cohn couldn't be here tonight. She's uh, from the village. Yes, store. yes, Jennifer. Yes. But books are available from her storefront and if you want to order them online as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you want to borrow <laughs> from the library, yes, yes, you can also do that in the interim while you wait for your copy. And on behalf of the Harrison Public Library, I'd love to thank both of you, Annette, Bender and Robert Schuster for uh, joining us tonight and telling us about your books. We look forward to hearing more about what you're working on next, which I'm sure you often hear as authors what you're working on next, but um, do keep the library in mind <laughs> and let us know. Uh, we're always happy to have you back and whether you're a local author or not, <laughs> we're happy uh, to see uh, our, our patrons, our community have access to authors. So, yes, and well, thank you, could, thank you so much for you're hosting. Very, very welcome. Very and welcome. moderating. Yeah. Yes, yeah. my pleasure. And for those of you from the library, you'll know that our summer reading ambassador this year is young adult author Stacy Lee. And Stacy Lee, whose new book just came out last month, Luck of the uh, on the Titanic will be speaking virtually online on Wednesday, June 23rd at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So if you'd like to hear more about her new book, please join us. And that is a virtual program. So just like this one, register online through the library's website on uh, www.harrisonpl.org.
And that concludes our program for this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you everybody for watching. Yeah, really, thank you very much.